Welcome to Coffee with the Googler, all the way from rainy Sydney, Australia. But it's great to be here because I'm meeting with Fontaine Foxworth. And Fontaine, you may know, was famous for her time with Firebase Analytics and all the great content she put together for that. But now you're here in Australia working on something else. Tell us all about it, Fontaine. Yeah, so I not only moved complete hemisphere, so moving from California down here to Sydney, but also totally changed the product that I was working on. Uh, I'm now in the in the maps and, and geo org and specifically focusing on the places API. So um, mapping technology is totally new to me, which has been really fun to understand how we actually like build and create our world digitally. And then um, specifically working on API development is also new to me. I've certainly consumed a lot of APIs while building mobile apps, but building APIs has been really interesting and really fun. So I'm working on Places API. So having been building apps that are all about consuming APIs, now you really know how to build one for people to consume. Yeah, right? yeah. I, I definitely feel like I've sat on the other side of the table quite a bit while consuming APIs. So I've got a lot of strong opinions about what types of things we should be offering. Well, Places API is already in great shape, so I'm looking forward to seeing how it evolves. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> so tell me, Places API, I'm familiar with it, but for the viewers who aren't, tell us, what is it all about? Yeah, so first of all, I'll start with the word place. Google has this notion of places, which is basically how we semantically understand the world around us. So it, for example, if you're talking about going to the Google headquarters, instead of typing in 1600 Amphitheater Parkway in California, you can just type in Google into Google Maps and it'll understand what you actually mean. So as humans, we actually understand the world not just in addresses or latitudes and longitudes, but actually categorizations like cafe or gym or trying to put these human qualifiers on top of places in the world. And so then if you look at the word API, that's really how we are distributing those places to all of our developers around the world so that they can be using and consuming all that place data in their apps. For an example, if you look at a, a local rides app or a taxi sharing app, that type of thing, instead of them having to keep track of all of the different places in the world, they can just use our API so that when their user ends up typing in Sydney Opera House, I want to go there, um, their driver actually knows where, where to also take them. Also, like something like Sydney Opera House, like a navigation system requires that most likely to be as a latitude and longitude, and then you exactly. can decode the place into the lat long. Yeah, so a place is so much more than maybe just what a user could input, but it actually filters into all these different use cases that our developers could have, like navigating. You know, I didn't actually know Google's address until you just told me. Oh, really? I, I feel like just everybody at, knows that. 1600. Amphitheater Parkway. Amphitheater Parkway. Yeah, okay. I feel I, like, yeah, there, there's a couple addresses that if you say them, some people know, but that's, I feel like one of them. But, but, but that's I'm the biased. classic <laughs> use of a, of a place's API, right? Yeah. So that sometimes you think in terms of my house, you don't think in terms of address. Or exactly, I think home or work. Yeah. For example, I just want to type in my sister's name whenever I'm navigating in, in Google Maps instead of actually typing in her address because that's how we think of it. Is she here in Australia or do you have She's to drive not, across the ocean? just when I'm back in California. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to see how it would navigate you. Yeah, the, so. maybe like swim across the Pacific Ocean, <laughs> something like that. Now, I, I hear you're a swimmer then. Since you've come to Australia, you've done some <laughs> diving. Uh, I have. I've done some uh, scuba diving. I went up to uh, the Great Barrier Reef a couple of weekends ago and did a liveaboard there. Did a whole bunch of diving. It was super fun, incredible sea life. So how has the relocation to Australia been? It's been really fun. There's been a, a little rain recently, which is actually kind of like California of late. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very lively city. It's nice that people speak English, so I can slip in pretty easily. Nice, nice. Um, but a very friendly office and, and great to, you know, we're building products about the world. So it's really nice to be able to see all different parts of the world. So you start to understand different cultural nuances as to how people actually address and approach maps. Oh, cool. Uh, how have you adjusted to being upside down? Yeah, it's, it's pretty weird. I get headaches a lot from being upside down all the time, but I'm getting used to it. <laughs> So back on Places API, so we were like you were talking about an example of somebody was building a ride sharing app and mm -hmm. you know you want to be picked up at a specific place like the Sydney Opera House. Yeah. And, you know, that that's a great example of how the, the places and the database of places is available to developers. But yep. how would somebody get started with doing that? So we've got pretty robust documentation on our developer site. Um, where you can actually first start to understand what are some of the use cases, how do you actually use it, and then what are some of the services and the different products that are available. Are you looking for mapping software? Are you looking for place stuff specifically? What types of metadata about a place are you interested in? So a lot of that is available, including code snippets and examples on a, all on our developer site. And then we've actually um, got some good content at I.O. 
So you can uh, look at some of the stuff that shows up at I.O. this year. Cool, and we'll have links to the videos in the description below for anybody who wants to see them. I'm looking forward to the sessions. Yeah, me too. <laughs> now, in order to be able to do this, like to have this great big database of places, there must be some way of identifying individual places on the planet. How, yes. How do you go about doing that? Exactly. So we've got something called a place ID, which is basically just an identifier for a place on the planet, for a location on the planet. And uh, if you think about it, the word place, I think is really interesting because it can mean a lot of different things to different people. So mm -hmm. for some people, if you're sharing a location, you really just want to share a latitude and a longitude. But uh, somebody else who's maybe doing a real estate website, they might want an address. And then a photo tagging app wants more of a semantic place like um, a university that's nearby or a weather sharing, a weather app might just want a city. Right. And so um, you can continue to think about more developers might want more and more robust or sophisticated data. So the great thing about the Places API is it's really flexible in, in terms of the types of data that we can actually provide to you. So whether you just need a latitude and a longitude or an address, all the way to really rich, robust information about all the details of a place, uh, we continue to serve the developers and all their different needs. That one identifier, the place ID, can effectively be like a primary key. Exactly. To that's all these great, different data sets. Great characterization. Cool. So if I want to build something that spans latitude and longitude or addresses or places and those kind of things, that if I'm working in terms of that identifier, that's giving me the key to everything. That's exactly right. And the nice thing about that is, of course, our world is growing and changing every day. So if you consider like a, a cafe over there that might be there, maybe in a couple of years it might not be a cafe anymore, it might be a gym or a laundromat. Well, the great thing about having uh, Google maintain the responsibility for the freshness of the data, the developer just really needs to remember and store the place IDs and then rely on us in the API to actually be returning the most up-to-date information. Right, so the address will stay the same, and the latitude and longitude will stay the same, but what's there? It's no longer exactly. a Exactly, we're laundromat. responsible for, for keeping that up to date. It's a really valuable service if you're building something that needs to find laundromats, for example. Exactly. Right, or you don't want to do, if it's no longer a cafe, you don't want to direct people there who are looking for coffee. When exactly, and it helps us really think in terms of longer horizons. So thinking about if your app's going to be around for many years, you want to make sure you're serving the most up-to-date data and relying on Google is a good way to do that. Now, one of the things was that you were talking about then, being able to pick a place, mm -hmm. like you, you had the scenario of picking the Sydney Opera House. Mm -hmm. But what about detecting if you're at a place? I yeah. Mean, how do the APIs work for that? So it really depends on what your use case is. So you can totally ask a user, uh, here are some nearby places, which one are you actually at? But then in other use cases, you might want to actually detect where they are if you have like a, enough information. For example, if you have a ride sharing app and you know where they are in their latitude and longitude, you can interpret where they are. Now there's a method called to get current place currently in our SDKs, which uh, takes into effect a lot of Google smarts. Right. So what I mean by this is we're not just interpreting the latitude and longitude and turning that into an address necessarily, but we might actually try to factor in a lot of other variables, like opening hours, for example. So an example I like to use is if there's this two-story building, and on the bottom floor there's a restaurant, and on the top floor there's a gym, they might have very different popular times. So if I see a user who is in a place at maybe 7 or 8 a.m. in the morning, and I know that people tend to be at the gym at 7 or 8 in the morning, and the restaurant isn't even open, I'm going to tell our developer that that user is at that place. Whereas if it's in the evening, maybe around 7 p.m. at night, I can infer that the user is probably at that cafe or that restaurant. So we're able to bake in a lot of our smarts and remove some of the heavy lifting from our developers. Right, and because it's multiple floors in the same building, the latitude and longitude is going to be the same. Exactly. So if you just use that, there's no intelligence. And right. The address is going to be the same. And so, but by integrating with the metadata from the Places API, like popular times and opening hours and that kind of thing, you can get a lot smarter about detecting exactly. where someone is. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a developer and I want to start building and I want to start using this kind of stuff, what advice would you give to me? Um, I think it's important to first start uh, to articulate what it is you're trying to do. So certainly there's lots of cool stuff available in our API, but think about what problem you're trying to solve and clearly articulate that and then go and, and match that with what we have in our services. So if you really just care about addresses and you don't care much as much about the different semantic places, then maybe you just start with some of the basics like geocoding. 
Um, alternatively, if you need uh, really rich, detailed information, then you might find some of our services like the Places Details uh, service would, would meet your needs. So definitely articulate clearly what it is you're looking to do and then uh, explore some of our services and how they meet those needs. Sounds good. So yeah. I think I'm going to get started right away. I've, cool. I've, There's a lot there. <laughs> yeah, I, I've already built a places-based game, but there's just so much that can be done with you. Ah, I look forward, forward to, to playing with it. <laughs> okay. So thank you so much, Fontaine. Yeah, this has thank been you. really, really fun. Thanks for making it down here for this lovely coffee in the rain. <laughs> yeah, I get to come to Australia. I'm, I'm, not too I'm bad. I'm not complaining, and my coffee <laughs> hasn't spilled out despite the cup being upside down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. So thanks, everybody, and uh, thanks again to Fontaine for being a guest on the show. If you've got any questions for Fontaine or any questions for me, just please leave them in the comments below, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. <laughs>